drawcomics.net. And today I'm here with Joshua Durstein. Is that how I pronounce your name? I'm pretty Durstein. sure I asked you that last time, but Durstein. Yeah. Durstein, like, like Frankenstein. Yeah. Like Frankenstein. Like Frankenstein. All right. Well, it's great to have you here again today. And we are taking a look at none other than his first debut comic book, Amarok. Let's get it up here for a second. It's it's really the star of the show. You know, Joshua, you're cool. But I mean, Amarok is really the eye candy uh, mm-hmm. here. So, wait, how do I share again? I'm forgetting myself. You'd think I just got out of bed, but I've been up for a few hours. I'm two coffees in. Yeah. What is going that, on? Uh, caffeine. Yeah, you got to have that caffeine. It's just an essential part of life. There it is, Emma Rock. So far, you've got 232 backers that have jumped on board. Absolutely amazing. Now, this is what I call success for a young comic book artist. I certainly wasn't seeing those numbers back when I was coming up in the game as a teenager. So, I mean, explain what that feels like. It must be so surreal to feel as though your your dreams are gaining some momentum right now that you might actually be able to make this comic book thing work yeah it's absolutely insane it's crazy i'm super grateful for the insane support so far it's been amazing um and so much in so little time so for this to be my starting out point it's very um encouraging for the future and definitely hopeful that i can fulfill my dream and, uh, you know, so far it's doing wonderful. So I couldn't be more gracious or grateful and gracious to the fans. So so you say it's encouraging for the future. Mm-hmm. What have people been saying? And tell me, in terms of encouragement, how does that really make you feel? Does that just make you want to draw more? Does yeah, it excite you that yeah. you might not have to get a real job? You might be able to keep this thing rolling along and actually sit down, keep on making comic books, or maybe it'll lead to more com- more commissions, more work mm-hmm. on other projects. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the ultimate goal is to never get a real job, right? So Yeah, nobody likes a real job. Is to just um, stay there and, uh, and draw comics. So I do have a special announcement for this stream. If you back the book during the stream, you'll get a little Amarok sketch card We'll do a little raffle from the people that back the stream, and we'll see um, who who wins that. But um, and anybody that backs the stream during the campaign while it's live is going to be winning, or not winning, but being entered into a raffle to win that David Finch cover. So if you want some free goodies, now is a perfect time to buy the book. So I love a David Finch cover. David Mm -hmm. Finch is legendary. It's amazing that you somehow talked him into jumping on board and uh, doing up a cover for you. How did that even happen? That's insane. When COVID hit 2020, Dave started or started back up his YouTube channel. And so he live streamed every night and I was a regular on that stream and he sort of noticed me. And then, you know, he, he followed me on Instagram and we kind of talked a little bit, talked back and forth. I wound up accidentally designing his little logo from taking his Skillshare oh, wow. course. Yeah, taking his Skillshare um, course about the superhero heads. Um, and there was, I designed a whole little Finch inspired superhero, slapped a logo on there, and he thought it was so cool that he used it for his website. So yeah, we've been kind of professional friends ever since. So it's been definitely mind boggling that um, I've gotten this far and that he's this supportive and, and gracious enough to allow me to launch the book on his channel and do a cover for it, so. Yeah, it is mind-boggling that he's your friend, your professional friend, (laughs) friend, and that you're doing logos for him, he's doing covers Mm -hmm. for your first comic book. I mean, your first comic book, David Finch, has dropped a cover for it. That's, I don't know, man, that's got to look good on a resume. (laughs) Yes, it does. So to know that people are digging the art within the book, take Mm -hmm. another look at that. They're digging the artwork in the book. They think the story is cool enough to pull money out of their pocket and put it toward this investment where they're going to ho- be able to hold Emma Rock in their hands. This is actually going to happen. Yeah, it's crazy. What's that feel like? 
that, that you, I mean, that's some serious <laughs> approval right there. That's some yeah. serious validation. <laughs> It is one of the most surreal feelings in the world, you know, to have this idea of I kind of want to um, been wanting to do a comic book since I was 15. Right. So and I never thought it would reach these kind of heights this fast. So for it all to just come together so perfectly has been an absolutely amazing experience and pretty unbelievable. Uh, I don't think I've even fully processed, you know, the um, the weight of, of the impact that I've had so far. So mm. it, it's pretty it's pretty crazy because i remember like just getting into comics and then just finding your website and trying to do the tutorials and trying to draw the head right and Ooh. trying to learn and trying to do all this stuff and now i'm here on your show promoting my book so it's definitely come a long way from where it started yeah talk about full circle how did you get good so fast tell me tell us your secrets Tell me your secrets, but also tell everybody else at the same time. What was it? Mm -hmm. What made the difference? Because you didn't just improve. You made a massive leap in the level of output and quality that you were producing. So what does that take for another young artist out there that may not be at your level? And heck, there's a lot of, I mean, there's some professionals out there that aren't at your level. Oh, thank you. What advice would you give them? Give them the... Uh, the goodies, you know, how do they, like, what did you use? What methods, what practices did you implement in order to get to the place at which you're at now? A young 18, I assume soon to be 19 comic book creator. About half a year, seven more months, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, what it really takes is just having your philosophy figured out, having your mindset figured out. And I think there's a big encouragement for you to figure your life out after high school, you know, you kind of get shoved into college and have to choose a career path right then and there. I chose my career path in seventh grade and I've been pursuing it ever since. And I've been taking it very seriously ever since, you know, it's not just a little background thing. I didn't really ever get a job, but I treated this as a job, you know, studying, drawing, learning every single day. I prioritize that above a lot of other things, you know, um, luckily for me, I didn't really have a social life. I was kind of a reclusive kid, but, but, um, it you were, you were a loner. In, yeah, yeah, definitely. It, um, it worked in my favor yeah, though, so was because I. I never had friends to hang out with or parties to go to or anything like that. So spent all my time drawing and bettering myself and trying to improve upon myself and improve my craft and really picking some key mentors and, and people to look up to with their philosophies and how they tackled this whole career and even other artists from other careers like, you know, Katsuhiro Tomo or even Mobius, you know, Mobius has some wonderful tips and um, just really taking mm. this dead serious and treating it because nobody's going to force you to draw. That's, that's the, that's the end thing of it is the only way you can really get forced to draw is if you go to an art college. But if you have, and going to an art college because you can find so many um, resources online to use and if you can really buckle down and actually learn from them and apply them instead of just like watching them in the background and putting it in the back of your mind if you take it very seriously like you would in a college then it is possible to improve um, rapidly if you have that sort of drive and that sort of determination and also just believing in yourself that you are capable of doing this because I find so many people thinking that they're incapable of, of getting better and that they don't have a talent. So there's no point in even trying. And I see some people get discouraged when I kind of come around this 18 year old kid blows them out of the water and it, and it can be discouraging because it's like I have this random talent. But the truth is, I know, I mean, I've spent years upon years honing my craft and that's really what it takes is the you know, the 10,000 hour rule to get just somewhat proficient at it. You, um, you really just got to put in the time. And that is the, the, the gritty answer of it is that there is no special trick. There's no magic trick. You just got to sit down and grind essentially. So, so what thought was it that jumped into your head that made you take it so seriously, that made you so determined? What, 
dream or ambition did you believe in so hard that you decided to fully commit on that level? Yeah. Um, I think the most wonderful thing about human and human nature is our ability to create, is our ability to use our imaginations. We were instilled with this completely unique ability that no other creature has. Um, nobody, no other creature can create worlds or universes. And it was so mind boggling to me that I could, that I have the capability to create an entire fictional universe with characters developed um, societies and worlds and, and all everything really just from my mind. I mean, that was the coolest thing in the world to me. And to be able to take a blank piece of paper and a wooden pencil, the two most accessible things in the entire world. I mean, everybody kind of has access to that. And that if you practice hard enough and train hard enough, you can create an entire fictional universe out of nothing. And I don't think there's a cooler feeling than that. And I don't think there's a cooler accomplishment that you can have in your life than creating something brand new that didn't exist on the earth before. And it being something that resonates with people on a deep emotional level. And that is just so inspiring to me and every day keeps me motivated. And that's really one of the main things that got me into drawing was that ability to create. I mean, if you think about it, it's really like a superpower in a way. So it's, it's really cool to cultivate. Yeah, absolutely. Just give me one moment, Josh. I'll be right back. Feel free to pitch and promote your book as much as you want. For but sure. I'll be back For in sure. just a quick moment. All right, everybody, if you have not backed Amarok yet, you are not going to want to miss this book. If you love 90s art, if you love a dark story with um, passion put into it, then you are going to want to get this book. Um, there is a David Finch cover that you can buy. And if you do purchase the book, like I said earlier, you will be put into a raffle to win the original. So you have every reason um, to purchase this. And during the stream, if you back it during this live stream, you'll be given, um, put into a raffle to win a free sketch card. Looks something like this. Um, I might give this one away. This is actually something I commissioned by another artist. I thought it looked really cool. So, um, that looks fantastic. Yeah. So if you back during the stream, you'll either get this or something like this. Um, well, you'll be put into a raffle to possibly win something like this. So um, if you back any physical tier, but um, I've worked really, really hard on this and I, and I think it's something that people are going to really enjoy. And obviously, if you love the How to Draw Comics art style, if you love Clayton Barton, Corey Barton's art style, I think Amarok is really going to resonate with you as well. So feel free to check it out. And I'm sure there's links in the chat to go back it. So if you want to take a look at it, um, this is the future of crowdfunding. So. Yeah, it is. And it's delivered us so many wonderful opportunities. So you mentioned that if you love Corey and I and the mm -hmm. work that we do, that you're probably going to dig Amarok. Now, our inspirations, as many know, are that of the works of David Finch and Mark Silvestri and Michael Turner is another big one. There's a ton of them. A lot of those artists reside within the 90s image era. Super amazing work. It gets yes. your creative juices pumping almost immediately as soon as you see it. Who were your biggest inspirations and why did you find yourself drawn to their work? Um, so my biggest thing in comics is my favorite art style is cartoonish foundations with realistic rendering on top of it. So guys like Ryan Stegman, David Finch, Brad Booth, uh, Philip Tan, one of my really big ones, obviously, is Stephen Platt. He's an amazing um, cartoonist. He has this very energetic style. The thing that I'm always constantly trying to do is infuse my art with a sense of energy, a sense of movement, something that you flip the page and you go, whoa, and it's just intense, like really in your face, something that's hyper detailed and that just kind of knocks you off your feet, really. Um, Todd McFarlane style, you know? But, um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Todd McFarlane was an incredible artist. And it was great because he kind of came up with his own approach to getting better. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. He made sense of a strategy that he felt should work. And you got to admire something like that because we take it so much for granted that there's so many approaches out there that are demonstrated to us for free online through YouTube videos, through courses, through, you know, you name it. There's a absolute plethora of information out there. If you want to learn how to draw, it doesn't take you very long to find the resources in terms of education that you need to be able to do it extremely proficiently. But for Todd McFarlane and a lot of those guys back then, they just didn't have that much available to them in terms of education. There were some things, of course. And, yeah. you know, I mean, how to draw comics the Marvel way was their Bible back then and probably is for a lot of people these days too. However, it was just really cool to hear how he took this more improvised approach where he would go out there and copy different mm -hmm. bits and pieces from the artists whom he wanted to draw like. So he'd draw the arms of their characters or he'd draw the faces and he'd link them all up together slowly but surely repeating the process over and over again, getting this mileage behind him. So that's something I'd like to ask you is you worked on developing your skill set for a long time mm -hmm. and put a lot of effort into it. What sort of timeline are we talking about here? Because that's something that I always want to know about is how long did it take somebody to get as good as they managed to get? And yeah. Uh, you know, how many hours throughout the day? Were you staying up late working on this stuff? Was your hand constantly moving, filling up sketchbook page after sketchbook page? Just how obsessed and insane were you in terms of drawing and, and getting to that level? Because, um, you know, it's, yeah. it's one thing to <laughs> practice for an hour a day, but it's another thing to practice for 16 or 17 mm -hmm. or who knows how much longer in terms of hours. So tell us, what was your experience like? What kind of path did you take? So I've always been mildly interested by drawing my entire life. It always sort of appealed to me. I thought it was neat. I thought it was cool. I didn't really take it that seriously. It was just something that I did for fun. How um, old were you back at that time? Uh, probably about like 11, 10, 10, 11. Yeah. Um, I really wanted to be a writer at that time. Um, that was my main goal that I was pursuing. And then around seventh grade, um, I really started wanting to get into art because of different concept art books that were coming out, actually, that really inspired me. These really unique ideas, um, like the Force Awakens book. It looked like Star Wars, but at the same time, nothing like Star Wars. So it was so cool to see these concepts and ideas that people came up with and that really got the gears turning into my head to develop my own universes and my own characters and my own stuff like that. And then I didn't even really start taking anatomy and gesture and perspective and all the stuff that you really need to know. I didn't really start taking that seriously until I was 15 when I really buckled down and decided that I wanted to become a comic artist. So it was everyday drawing. Um, I would do finished pieces of art. I would do sketches. I would get 11 by 14 sketchbooks, really big ones, and just fill them up from front to back. You know, I have three 200-page uh, sketchbooks like that that are just filled wow. with studies. And at, at that point, I really, I've stopped using sketchbooks. I just have used printer sheets. So I have, I'm not even kidding, like a thousand pages of just printer sheet studies of my favorite artists, of artists that I found that I just think are cool and really, you know, breaking down the forms, breaking down the figures, breaking down the construction behind the drawing um, and just really building up my own sort of visual shape language and also, you know, studying Bridgman, studying Michael Hampton, studying, you know, anybody that I could find really and always staying open to learning and trying new methods and studying animators and, you know, Michael Mattisai and, and Glenn Vilpu and Disney animators and just mm. never really like narrowly just choosing to stick to one thing. I think it's very important to build a very strong base of artists and art that you are going to be inspired by. 
but I think it's very limiting if you stick to one particular artist, because if you just stick to, to, to David Finch, you're, you're going to draw like a poor version of David Finch. So you really need to be expanding out to other learning resources and artists to build your visual dictionary and, and visual knowledge so that you can apply what you learn from David Finch and what you learn from those guys and do something that looks um, stable and professional and, mm. and not just like a copycat. So that's sort of where the idea of style comes into play and, and how I believe that you develop your style. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Now that you're seeing people jump on board and back your book through the campaign page, mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about how that's changed your perspective on things. Has it made you a little bit more nervous? And has the expectation been built up a little bit for you? What's it like to work on the comic book now as opposed to before you launched? Has anything changed? Not particularly. So money's always been like a weird thing for me because I exist in the digital age. So whenever I do commissions or stuff, I usually get paid through PayPal. So to me, it's just numbers on a screen. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really, like I have made, what, $14,000 almost, but that doesn't even register in my mind as, as $14,000. Yeah. But, you know, it's been an absolutely insane experience. And, um, you know, if anybody wants to back the book, I'm sure we have a link in the chat or stuff like that. And I think there's a trailer at the top if you want to, if you want to show that off. Um, yeah, that was sure. actually cool. I hired different musicians to make the soundtrack for it. So that that's was, pretty amazing. And I think you're really going to dig it. It's, um, it's really I'm, punk rock. So I'm going to play it in just a moment. Awesome. But, uh, I mean, yeah, you know, seeing the numbers on the screen, totally get that why yeah, there would be a little bit of a disassociation there, but then you see 232 backers waiting for this book. I mean, that's got to make you a little bit like, Oh man, I better give these people something good. Cause it, when you're doing it just for yourself, you can sort of do whatever you like and you can take right. as long as you want. You can really enjoy it. There's a certain level of freedom when you're just, you know, you're your own audience. And now you've you've actually got a, a very large – if you put 200 people into a room, that's a lot of people. It is a lot of people. So, and they're all going to be holding a copy of Emma Rock in their hands, reading it, experiencing it. How does that make you feel? I mean, it's definitely a lot of pressure. You want to make sure you do a good job. And and the thing about creating is that you're so wrapped up in it yourself that it is such an integral part of who you are that to have other people experience it is sort of this surreal experience that doesn't exactly feel um, like it's like it's actually happening because this consists so much of what you think about for other people to tangibly hold that in their hands and to experience it without any of the bias or context that you have for it is definitely insane to think about um, that it's actually going out there because, you know, people could hate it. They could love it. You really don't know. It's up to the fans. At the end of the day, there's nothing you can do to, you know, change anybody's opinion on it. But Yeah, I think that's especially true for story in the kind of comics we do as well because – as far as the visuals are concerned, I feel pretty confident about our visuals. I mm -hmm. feel very confident about your visuals. I mean, they're absolutely stunning. There's no question about it. The visuals, you do not have to feel nervous about whatsoever. But then it's it's always the story, for me at least, that I'm wondering, are people going to dig this story? Are they going to connect with yeah, it? Are sure. they going to get immersed within it? Are they going to want to see more? Because what I've found is that the visuals are a great hook point to get people interested enough in the comic book to actually start reading and engaging with it. But as soon as they start reading and engaging with it, as amazing as the visuals are and as much as they enhance the experience of the story, uh, they're almost, they almost take a back seat to the story. After yeah, after a certain sure. amount of time, and like a good video game, really, it's mm -hmm. 
like your great gameplay within a video game. The visuals might look cool, but I mean, the reason you're there is because it it plays well. So, uh, yeah. Well, how you how do you think people are going to react to the story itself of Emma Rock? Um, I honestly don't know. I think I have a very unique story on my hands. I think I have something that hopefully resonates with people and maybe shocks and surprises them a little bit. And uh, at the end of the day, I mean, it's up to the reader, but I have something, I've been developing this for years in my head. So I have some really intense, detailed story beats figured out and all sorts of different twists and turns and ideas for what kind of character Amarok is. And, you know, if you look at the campaign, um, there's different little blurbs for what the story's about, what the character's about. And I think um, either Corey or one of the other mods can probably put a link to it, uh, the Amarok Indiegogo campaign uh, for people to check out. But um, Yeah, please do that, mods. Yeah, the story is something that's really near and dear to my heart. And obviously the art is always going to be a, a hook point it's going to really draw people in but i'm hoping that they stay for this story and that they are intrigued in this uh, by the story and that it draws them in and sort of gets them lost in this whole new world and um really deeply resonates with them i mean it's a story that has a lot of different serious topics about this sort of i mean it's an allegory for cycles of abuse with different you know, we live in an age of escapism where you can essentially just, there's so many products at your fingertips that you can just indulge in that gives you short-term gratification that makes you feel great in the moment, but then winds up completely ruining you. And we live in an age where that's encouraged and actively uh, pursued. And um, you're sort of shoved into that system of working eight hours a day and then coming home and being exhausted. So the only thing you do is gratify yourself. And then you just repeat the same thing over and over and over. And you sort of get lost in this cycle of, you know, of completely becoming um, a shell of a person. So I think this is really a book about finding your purpose and finding why are you here? You know? Yeah, that's great. I love that premise because yeah. I completely agree. I think that unfortunately, we as human beings um may be devolving yeah we could be devolving i suspect it and uh it's simply because there's an abundance of pleasure now mm -hmm. for human beings to indulge in whereas once upon a time it took a lot for us to leave a state of suffering, of surviving each and every day into thriving and you know being okay. Now everybody's pretty much okay for the most part, for the most part. And when they become not okay, because society has been conditioned and somewhat spoiled in a sense, we don't know how to survive a not okay situation anymore. Uh, you know, yeah. when you've got that, when you're raised in a society where there's an, a sense, a sense of entitlement, where there's a sense of, Hey, I matter and I'm important and I, it's all about me. And then shit hits the fan. Right. Well, how, you don't have the tools at your disposal to be able to deal with that. You haven't been brought through fire yet. Mm -hmm. You haven't you haven't gone through hell. And so many of us simply don't have what it takes to be warriors and to yeah, make it sure. through those hard times. So, yeah, I mean, I, I relate with your story already just hearing that particular premise. Um, now, <laughs> it's funny because I have a little bit of a darker view to that where I'm like, well, there's less competition for people like you and I, Josh, you know, right. maybe the herd does need thinning to an extent, but at the end of the day, regardless of where you fall in terms of what you believe people uh, should be 
living up to and what they should be capable of and what happens to them if they're not, there's one truth that will always hold, and that is you get out what you put into something. Yes. And so if you're making effort, you will be moving forward, and there is no doubt about that. So, um, yeah, even if you're you're in the worst situation possible, and I'm sure we'll see this in Emma Rock, I'm sure he's going to have his fair share of battles, struggles. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But there's so no the doubt that he's, he's going to do something to get out of them, I'm sure. Yeah, with the first arc, actually, is that he is at the top of the food chain as far as things are concerned. He is, as far as he knows, the most powerful being there. And very quickly in this issue, he's knocked down the food chain and he realizes he's, he's not this all-powerful being. He can bleed, he can take a punch, and he's going to take a very hard punch. And I mean, you know, back to what we were saying earlier with escapism, the whole allegory in this book is that the magic drugs, they give you these very insane powers, but they also suck a lot out of you, and they are very demanding, and you get addicted, and you practically need them to survive. So if you do indulge in this unholy union of of science and magic you essentially become a slave to the drug um and so now what is that a metaphor that. what is that a metaphor for uh probably just actual substance abuse like any yep. sort of thing that gives you immense pleasure in the moment so the internet drugs or <laughs> video the <games>. internet <laughs> alcohol video games even just stuff like going on a shopping spree or um, overeating or indulging in an unhealthy lifestyle it can all sort of relate back to this and obviously in comics you don't want to read a comic about losing weight right nobody cares about that this is a cool comic that's the first thing that comes first is story first cool factor first and everybody loves magic and magic drugs are the obvious way to go you know very sort of akira inspired with that mm -hmm. as well and uh i just think it's a really fun concept to play around with just this idea that you can take this drug to get superpowers um, and it uniquely affects each person depending on their blood type and DNA makeup. But at the same time, it comes at a very heavy cost. So, Man, that sounds cool. I don't yeah. know if I'd be strong enough to resist something like that. Yeah, for sure, man. It's either superpowers or a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy. I mean, getting into this topic, I don't want to get too far off track, of course, but... Right. Man, it just makes me think about the long-term ramifications of such substance abuse. You know, like social media, for example. Am I going to be able to think straight by the time yeah. I'm 40 or 50? For sure. I don't know. Because we have no My idea what the long-term effects of, of anything is, really. We're just diving headfirst into this, you know, TikTok overload of information and overstimulation of stuff that was not even available a few years ago. So. Oh, yeah, totally. So the before we watch the trailer, and we will watch the trailer, of course, uh, what I just want to ask you real quick, are you still there, Josh? Yeah, there you are. All right. Um, what I'd just like to ask you is, with the detail, why have you gone for such a rendered, heavy approach to your uh, line art? I can't hear anything right now. Oh, you can't hear anything? Oh, that's unfortunate. Mm, it messed up. I'm going to leave and come back and see. Okay, if that no problem. I don't know if you can hear me. No, I, I can hear you. I can hear you. That's all right. All right. Well, hopefully everybody else can hear me. All right. We've got Josh back. He can hear me finally again. Yeah. What I wanted to ask you is when it comes to the heavily rendered style that you've decided upon for your line art. Uh, tell me what caused you to be drawn toward that particular look and, and what do you love about it? Because it takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of time and energy. You got to commit to a line art style like that. What is yeah. it that's pushing you to do it? There's something about the line that is very crisp and very final that you don't really get with like a painting or a simpler art style. And in comics, since we're working in completely black and white, we have absolutely no way to do grayscale. 
um, with ink at least. You know, you can use your gray Copic markers or something. I know there's some artists that are really good at that. But otherwise, the only way to essentially create this sense of depth and create this sense of grayscale is to do the intense cross-hatching and to do all these lines all over the place to create a sense of um, dynamic lighting and dual lighting and a rim light and all that kind of stuff. And earlier on in my art journey, I had been very David Finch inspired. So I was doing more final dark shadows, bigger blockier shadow shapes. And I still do those sometimes depending on the mood, but I have just really gravitated towards the fun that you have with lines and just how intense it is to look at. I don't think you can get a more intense art style than a very heavily rendered art style with lots and lots of lines because it's just a detail overload that oh, yeah. sort of can blow your mind, you know. So Yeah, it does. It uh, slaps you in the face a little bit. Yes, sir. Uh, it's yeah. something that you notice, something that pulls you straight in. You just want to investigate further what the heck is going on. And uh, yeah, it's really quite something to witness when you see a page that has that level of line art rendering and detail put into it. It reminds me a lot of Philip Tan's work mm -hmm. and uh, just generally the 90s uh, style, but you've, you seem to be going beyond that. I feel like I I'm think you're trying. taking it to a I'm whole trying. other level. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really amazing to see because you have got your own thing going on. You're polishing up on your style. You're developing yourself further and you're really starting to hone a look for your work that I believe is going to be very recognizable to you. It's great to be able to set your art apart from everybody else's out there. So you're someone who has managed to have done that again at a very young age and now to be able to develop that further to just refine that from the point at which you're at it's go it's insane to think about where you're going to be in terms of skill by the time you're 25 or 30 do you ever think about that where your artwork is headed in the not too yeah. distant future and, and what it's going to be like where you want to take it next yeah for sure i mean it's definitely crazy to think about it's a little intimidating to think about because you can't see into the future you have no idea where you're going to go because this entire thing is a journey of a thousand steps so you're just taking a step forward each time and and going into the darkness and and you don't really know like where you're going or where your art style is going to go or what's going to happen with you and you're just hoping that it turns out for the best and that you don't fall into any holes along the way and, and I mean the main thing is to just keep going and and I mean obviously I hope I get a lot better that would be the goal but um you know just constantly doing my best to stay hungry and to try and improve as much as I can so yeah for sure for sure all right let's check out this trailer I'm excited to see this and it looks like there's some sound going on there so we should be all set
Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. Very Thank nice work really there. Well. Yeah. Thank you. So, Josh, would you describe yourself as a perfectionist? Definitely, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> do you think that helps you or holds you back? It is a double-edged sword because you want everything to look perfect, but obviously you're just starting out. So you can't make everything look perfect, and it can be very frustrating. As a very detail-oriented person, I find that navigating my life can be uh, a whirlwind of events because I'm so focused on different details and and really trying to get everything to go right and that's obviously just not how life goes all the time so you know obviously that applies to art and wanting to put as much detail as i can or you know the age-old struggle of a comic artist is how many backgrounds do i put on a page because you kind of want to put a background in every panel but that can slow your flow down that can slow that can make the composition look worse um you know it can it can mess things up so being such a detail-oriented perfectionist you want to go all out for every single thing so it is hard to be more minimalistic and to pull back on certain aspects that might wound up serving you better and saving you time and, and getting stuff done faster but being such a perfectionist does allow me to put my all into every page and to give this project everything i have and um so you know always striving for for um for perfection and the wonderful thing about crowdfunding is that this isn't a monthly book i don't have to stick to insane deadlines i can really take my time to make this thing as perfect as i possibly can at this stage in my life and my career and i'm going to look back on it in a few years and, and probably hate it but that's the wonderful thing about growth is that you're constantly improving so yeah, I mean, don't be so sure about that. Sometimes, and this is very interesting, what I've found is I'll look back on some of the old work I've done, even some of the old YouTube videos that I created, and I'll think, damn, I kind of admire that guy. Yeah, I mean, like, sometimes sometimes you have that. You right. You remember the amount of effort that you're yeah. putting in back then and how much it meant to you yeah, for and sure. just that that energy when you recall it at a certain time later on when you know you've gotten to the swing of things you know what you're doing and the energy really isn't as intense where you're at anymore yeah so i think there's something to be said about starting off in the early days and being in that state of really trying and pushing and doing anything you can to make progress, to get from where you are to where you want to be. And getting to where you want to be can be a scary thing because you get there and you ask yourself, what comes next? For sure. Where do I go yeah. from here? And that's when you can start to find that that energy that you once had, that fire within you starts to die down a little bit and you have yeah. to find a new reason, something else to stoke the fire. Definitely. So don't be so sure that you're going to look back on this stuff and think, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I do. I mean, who knows? You might be doing it at such an early time at this point. You will feel those things. But I think just objectively, I can tell you that your artwork is on an insane level. I think in the future, if I was to make a prediction, you will hone in the details a little bit and create more of a balance within your work. I'm not yeah. saying that it needs it. I'm not saying that anything needs to change about your art. I just, this is a prediction that I think is going to possibly come true as you develop. You'll, you'll start to evolve your eye where you are more strategic about where you place the detail. Because right now you have an abundance of detail in all of your art. Right. It's amazing. It reminds me of this series of Spawn. I'm not sure if you would have uh, seen it before. It was a particular series. 
I don't know if it was called Hellspawn or something like that, but the detail in it was just on an insane level. It was all in black and white too. Oh yeah, looked absolutely amazing, and uh, and it reminds me a little bit of your work. And you can just That's imagine the amount of time that went into it, the hours, <laughs> the days, and I feel like with your art, uh, what's going to happen is yeah, you're you're going to look at it. And you're slowly but surely going to start to realize that of the state detail is amazing, but it's even more impactful when it's balanced out with areas where the eye rests, Mm -hmm. where the eye can take in just the void of white space or even black space depending on what you decide to do. I mean, who knows where you'll take it? Maybe you'll get even more detailed. Who knows? Yeah, I definitely realized that at this stage in my career, I'm going all out with my details and I'm going yeah, just you have to unbridled intensity with the line work. And this is, you know, this is like how Stephen Platt started out, right? Detail, detail, detail all over the place. And as he continues on in his career, he really starts to refine his style and, and bring it down to something that, you know, lets the eye rest a little bit more. But I think it's important to harness the energy I have now with all this intense amount of detail. Um, Sorry, voice correct. With all this intense amount of detail and then realize that at some point, you know, because I'm going to be in the game for decades and decades and decades. So there's no telling where it's going to go or what's going to happen. But it's like everybody tells me, hey, stop putting so many lines. And I'm like sort of at a point where I'm like, I'll stop putting so many lines when it feels right to me yeah. and when I feel comfortable with it. Um, because at this point, I really want to... The most important thing about art, and this is the first time I came on your show with Eric Canetti, he gave such wonderful advice. The most important thing about having art is that you get to draw. It's fun. It's supposed to be fun. You're supposed to be excited and inspired when you're doing it. And if you're trying to force yourself to do something that you're not personally excited by then it sucks the fun out of it and it becomes like a job and then you don't want to do it and you don't want that to happen. So I've always been an advocate for making sure that your style flows and progresses naturally because, you know, when I started out, I was very much more similar to David Finch and now I've moved a lot farther away from that. So just letting it go where it takes you and always staying inspired is the most important thing to me. Totally. I think you've got to push to the very limits of what you're capable of at any point of time. You've got to see just how far you can take this detail. Yes. You've you've got to know what that is. There's a certain amount of push that we have to pursue that until we're satisfied. Once we're satisfied, once we know what we're capable of, then we can make a choice. We can either keep doing it or we can pull back. But you've got to be able to see the epitome of what you can achieve. And that certainly happened for me. I pushed myself and I, I got to a point where I was mas- I'd was mastered rendering for me. I'd mm-hmm. put all the detail that I possibly could into my work. And now I'm at a little bit of a, a crossroads, I guess. I mean, I've always had two styles. I've had a cleaner style. I've had a really detailed style. But I think as you get older, you do lose a little bit more energy you could argue you lose some patience too. But you start to think about the time that you've got as more responsibilities start to come about, such as family and, you know, you could could just be doing chores around the house, Uh, family trips, whatever it is that's starting to occupy your time more and more as you go into that next phase of life. Whereas when I was in my 20s, I had all the time in the world. In my 30s, I'm balancing things out a little bit more. I'm not staying up as late. I'm not burning the candle at both ends as much anymore. And so I start to find myself optimizing my artwork a lot. And I go, well, I want to still produce art. And I want to do it at the same rate that I was doing it before, even if I've got less time. So what if you can't make more time? and other things are starting to creep in that takes it up, then 
what has to happen is that you've got to figure out faster ways of executing your art to the same degree of quality, but maybe not in the same way. And I just think that that's how things evolve. Things evolve through pressure. That's how diamonds are created. And so you've got to have that pressure. You've got to have those outside influences, those things that cause you to battle forth in order to be able to push forward and find new versions of your art style. And you've seen this with artist after artist. It's kind of crazy that David Finch has stayed as consistent as he has stayed over the years. But if you look at people like, I mean, Jim Lee has just gotten more detailed. Mark Silvestri has gotten more detailed. But they mm-hmm. they each went through these different phases within their styles. I guess because they've got a little bit more time and maybe a little bit more money, they don't have to worry about necessarily holding back on that detail. They can tend to take longer if they want to. But you could see that when they were trying to push out a monthly book or a book every one or two months, that they were really starting to tighten things up a little bit, especially Mark Silvestri. You saw that in a lot of his work. But, you know, I look at an artist like Michael Turner, and this is what used to just blow my mind is how desirable his artwork looked, even absent of detail. It was almost like you perceived detail being there that wasn't there somehow. And it could have been because of the amazing colorists that would go over the top of his line art and really bring it to life. But still, it was there was a certain amount of elegance to his style that I just really admire. You could say similar things about J. Scott Campbell's work. It's a little bit more detailed, a little bit more stylized, but yet nonetheless, it is uh, definitely one style that is desirable out there. You could say that those styles that are more cleaner have somewhat more of a, a feminine appeal to them, while the more detailed, heavy stuff has a more masculine appeal, just in the in terms of the way that it looks, if you were to describe it as either or. And uh, then at the same time, with a style such as Mark Silvestri's cleaner look, he's still using those sharp corners on his contours. And that still, you know, has the energy. It, it still pulls that masculinity back into it, you know, sharp, hard edges rather than curvaceous, sleek, what J. Scott Campbell would use as contours. And so. Yes, it's really interesting the ways in which style can evolve over time and you're really still at the beginning of your journey. It's already evolved a lot. You started out with David Finch, now you're pushing it forward, getting some more of a Philip Tan flavor, and now you're you're going even beyond that. And as to what it will be that inspires the next direction you take with the work that you produce well we'll have to wait and see have you got some new artists in your peripherals that are starting to pull your style in new directions at this point in time or are you just kind of focusing on the one course at this uh, right now with your work yeah um mainly i'm focusing on you know i really like brett booth's um energy that he puts in his figures and also how he constructs his figures um is very dynamic and organic and it's sort of the scribble method that's talked about in the how draw comics the marvel way that i don't really see being taught a lot it's a very difficult thing to sort of figure it out because it's much more organic you're not relying on the building blocks as much you know, Mark Sylvester uses it too. So I've been looking a lot into his artwork and how he cross has it, my bad, cross hatches and does his detail, um, as well as Stephen Platt is a big one. And just those really hyper detailed 90s artists. Um, there was another one, he inked over Jim Lee. He did a book called Brass. Uh, his name is slipping my mind right now, but he was insanely detailed. And so I've been looking at a lot of his work as well. And, um, you know, it's really inspired the look for Amarok. And um, if you guys want to see that, it's all, I got a lot of the pages up on the campaign page and you can see the different stuff that you can buy and, and the different covers you can get. Obviously we have the amazing Rob Willis on this book. We got a Canaan White cover and the big one, the David Finch cover. 
So can't wait to see that David Finch cover. He actually did email me today and he said he'd be getting it to me tomorrow. So amazing. Hopefully, hopefully we get to see it. Have you got a preview of that that you can show us here today? Um, I took a screenshot from the from the YouTube live stream that I can. Yeah, probably... have you got that handy? Oh, we'll share it here so people can see what's in store, what they can expect. Oh, Josh has jumped out of here. Look at this incredible art. It's absolutely beautiful. Just stunning. This is a Rob Willis cover. Rob Willis is one artist that truly inspires me. The level of detail, the texture, the intricacy that he adds into this, just this platform here in the foreground is beyond mind-blowing. There we go. There's Josh. So I um, I just sent you a message on Twitter. That's the David Finch cover oh, so far. gotcha. So, um, yeah, and I saw somebody in the chat said I was talking about Richard Bennett. That is the name of the artist, and he has some amazing, amazing artwork from the 90s. So mm. oh, he okay. did a little bit of um, work on Gen 13. He did his own book. He did some... Uh, I think he did a little bit of Wildcats. So. Very cool. All right. So this is the David Finch cover. Now it's coming so along far. thus far. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, absolutely insane mastery. And um, the funny thing is, is if anybody watched the stream, they know this, but the mechanical arm that Amarok has, Dave was not aware that it was a mechanical arm. So it started off as a human arm. And then he was like, oh, I need to fix this. And he just goes in and he does a perfect bang up job of it. Drawing one of the best mechanical arms you've ever seen, <laughs> even though mm. he wasn't even aware that it was a mechanical arm at first. So, wow. Yeah. I just He's... love uh, David Finch's ability to produce contrast with his shadows. Yeah. It introduces this whole other level of drama into his pieces. It's got the cinematic flavor happening within it. And then sure. his use of shape as well. L just look at the contours of this arm here. This is a perfect oh, yeah. example of what I'm really getting into, what I'm really focused on, because I just feel like it makes the biggest difference. It increases the vividness of your artwork a billion fold if you're able to really focus on it. Jim Lee does yeah, the same yeah. thing. It's one of his yeah. the reasons his artwork is so desirable, but... Yeah, just look at the, the, the solidity to this torso here. Yeah. It's amazing. Mind-boggling, yeah. I can't wait to see uh, the end product of this. That's going to be one heck of a cover. And yeah, you must be sure. absolutely stoked with that, I'm Josh. I'm so excited. I've been waiting. I've been, I've been impatiently waiting to see it. Um, I mean... It's the craziest thing to have like one of your all time favorite artists to draw your own character. I mean, it's oh. doesn't doesn't get better than that. Wow, you know? man, I would have had shivers. Yeah, I would have sure. been trembling in my seat seeing that come together. Yeah, my goodness. Um, and by the way, you know, you mentioned something very interesting about that looser style and how mm. it seems like some artists begin breaking away from the strict fundamentals after a certain amount of time. I don't think you have to worry about co copying that style necessarily. I think oh, yeah. in the beginning, as early as you are in the journey, structure is good. Mm -hmm. And re really making sure that you master that aspect of drawing the foundations is at the top of your list of priorities. Yeah. In as far as importance is concerned. And then what you'll find, Josh, is what I've been finding in maybe the last, I would say, year or two or three, is it naturally starts to happen. You naturally begin just breaking away from that stuff um, and your creativity becomes untethered. You're able right. to 
start to break outside of the confines of the things that you learn to structure your artwork in the first place. And I've just I've just discovered that it's happened organically where yeah. now it's it's much more of a sculpting process I would describe it as where you can draw down just a football or an oval for a head and start to place in the cheekbones and all of a sudden that's all you need to be able to draw a really great looking head for some reason. You don't have to follow the Loomis method anymore. What's going on? Of course, you can always rely on those foundational principles that you learned in order to get you out of trouble. If you find that an artwork isn't quite working out the way that you want it to, you can call upon your underpinning knowledge in those areas to ensure that your artwork is properly structured and to be able to troubleshoot areas within it that aren't quite working if you can't figure them out. But yes, uh, don't be too concerned about that, I would say. You'll be able to just break away from that stuff organically yeah, over time. For sure. I think the journey of an artist is one that's definitely riddled with impatience because as soon as you start out you want to be able to draw what's in your head and you yeah. realize this is going to take a decade to essentially you know be able to do that and so but you're trying to find ways to to improve as quickly as you can so that you can draw straight from your head and it's definitely very important to take time and and study those fundamentals and you know yeah. I always try to move on too fast and I'm like, oh, okay, I need to go back and, and study this stuff that, I, that I've been ignoring, neglecting a little bit. So Yeah, for sure. Well, here's something weird that I think might help you out. You could try it if you want, yeah. but uh, drawing with your peripherals. So rather than looking directly at what it is you're drawing, sort of like mm. unfocus your vision somewhat. I don't know if you can just do that. Like for me, I just kind of like look at the screen and, let my eyes go cross-eyed or something and it just mm. sort of blurs but uh i call i call it drawing with your peripherals where you're sort of you're, you're still looking at the art but maybe just off to the side of it where you can still see what it is you're actually working on but you're not but you're, you're able to take out a certain level of detail and focus just on two things two primary things the shape and gesture and maybe the, the larger forms of anatomy that need to be attended to. And what I have found is that's led to drawings that have more of a natural energy to them, more of an appealing shape and uh, just vitality overall. Whereas if you're looking directly at it and you're really focused on trying to, to get it right, I found that that just leads to uh, drawings that it's almost as if you're 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 not seeing the forest through the trees. You know, you're getting caught in the weeds a little bit. Yeah. And what you want to do is really kind of zoom out overall. This will be great for your panels too when you're plotting out where the characters are positioned and how the buildings are structured around them or the backgrounds are there to com compose their framing you'll be able to work on your composition a bit better. That's the other thing that it allows you to do. So, yeah, try that. It might work in my mind. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful idea. I'm probably going to try that tonight, actually, and I'd love to see if you have any examples of you um, doing that or what work you did that for because uh, yeah. it's definitely a good idea and definitely something I want to look into and really yeah. own yeah, it. Yeah, hopefully it'll so, work out. Yeah. Um, but you know what? We'll wrap it up here. We're uh, three minutes past one hour. It has been an absolutely amazing talk. I know you've got other appointments that you have to attend, uh, other talks that you must yeah. do. You're out there promoting this book really hard at the moment, which is exactly what you need to be doing when it comes to running a comic book campaign. So uh, you'll likely need a bit of a break before you jump onto the next show just to refresh. What time is it where you are in the world? It is currently 10.41 p.m., so a bit uh, of a late, late night tonight. Yeah. Getting late. Going to have to get some uh, well, coffee. Do you drink coffee? Maybe not. I actually really don't do caffeine. Yeah, actually. you don't do caffeine. any drugs, right? Yeah, don't do drugs, kids. Go read comics about drugs. Don't do drugs. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, but um, I realized that caffeine doesn't really have such an effect on me. So 
Yeah, it doesn't yeah. have much of an effect on me either. It's really the sugar that right. is my main addiction to it. Yeah. And uh, I tried giving it up today, um, but I was so cranky. I yeah. was just too cranky. And I didn't yeah, want to be cranky be while I was talking grumpy. to you, Josh. So I used you yeah. as my excuse to put it off <laughs> till tomorrow. So thank you for that. Um, enabling your addiction. Wonderful. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. right. All right. Well, it's been amazing, Josh. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that we get to catch up again real soon. And for everybody who tuned in today, it wouldn't be the same without you. So thank you, thank you so much. If you decided to back Emma Rock on Indiegogo, link is in the description, by the way, if you'd like to check it out. Uh, thank you for backing if you did. And thank if you, you haven't yet, just go and check out yeah. the campaign. See if it's your kind of deal. And uh, be sh remember to share it. Let's sh let's help creators like Josh get their work out there, get eyes on it, so that we can perpetuate their success and ensure that they're able to make more of what it is they love creating for us. Josh, any final words? Um, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I will get back with one of the backers who won during the stream, um, who won and what they won. So thank you for everybody that backed during the stream. And um, if you haven't backed yet, you do still have that chance to get in the raffle to win that David Finch cover, the original artwork it is, by the way. So it's a, either in the live chat or you can check the description. Um, and you can you can back the book and I promise I will deliver you a product that is worth your time, at least in some aspects, oh. hopefully. So. Man, all right. Well, I might, I'm going to have to back that. So if I back it, mm -hmm. there's a chance I could win that David Finch uh, cover. There's a chance. Well, you have to get a physical perk. I do have a digital option, but if you get a physical perk, any of the perks, you do have that chance to win a David Finch original. So even if none of this appeals to you and you want that chance to win the David Finch original, so far, there's only 200 people, 230 people in the in the raffle pool. So there is a pretty big chance that you have the possibility to win. So I feel like I have is, a lucky name. Yeah, Clayton Barton. It's very um iconic. Yeah. So, yeah, Clayton I feel like my Barton. name my name is not that iconic. Joshua Durstein. People can't get it right. It's Durstein, Durstein, all over the place. <laughs> I remember. Um, Durstein yeah. Frankenstein. Durstein Frankenstein. All right. There you go. That's the David Finch cover you could win, man. If I won that, I would, uh, I would frame it or something. Yeah, for sure. I would, I would, man. How do you not want to keep that? So the awesome <laughs> thing is that I already have a David Finch original. Um, oh, right. Actually, he he gifted me one, uh, the Mandalorian. It's really cool, and um, I'm hoping he sends this one to me because I would like to see it in person. But um, you know. I'm not a huge original art guy. I can I can look at something. I'll probably stare at it for like a solid hour. And then I'll be like, okay, I've enjoyed it enough. Now I can give it away to somebody else to, to enjoy it as well. So. Yeah. Well, I feel like I would look at... See, I'm not a big original art fan. Well, I'm not a big original art collector either. Yeah. And it's not that I don't love it. I, I love it. It's just oh, I yeah. collect it yeah. as images from the internet. But something like this... I feel like I would put it on my wall and it would just remind me of why I'm doing this, you know, why I'm an why I'm a comic book artist. Yeah. And I'll just, definitely be making a, uh, a poster of it for myself. I definitely oh, want oh, that. Oh yeah. For yeah. sure. Um, for sure. But yeah, that's that's an amazing piece. That's a but, magical one. You don't you don't yeah. see pieces like that often. I, sure, I love just the, sure. the the solidity of it, the the whole sense of form, especially around this section, as the torso pulls away into shadow. Yeah, and just that arm—it's incredible. Ah, oh, man! All right, I'm gonna back the book and Thank you. just work on my voodoo to make my <laughs> name lucky. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool, Josh. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure as always. Until it's next time, everybody, keep on drawing, and I'll catch you in the next stream. 
which may actually be today. So keep a lookout. We'll see what happens. All right. Bye-bye for now.